Hello and welcome. This is View from the Top and I am Modele Sharafa Yusuf. It's been called the resource curse, that paradoxical situation in which countries with an abundance of non-renewable resources experience significant economic and social challenges. In Nigeria, the arrival of crude oil and petroleum resources literally poisoned and damaged the environment, the economy, our politics, and even our social cultural relationships. Agriculture and manufacturing were ignored while oil became the biggest foreign exchange earner. Today, in a manner of speaking, the chicken have come home to roost and the crash in oil prices has made Nigeria too, for the first time, look seriously in other directions for revenue. To spearhead the diversification of the Nigerian economy by expanding and increasing non-oil exports for sustainable and inclusive economic growth, the Nigerian Export Promotion Council was set up and NSPC says its vision is to make the world a marketplace for Nigerian non-oil products. In a self-assessment, the CEO of NEPC, Olushe Gwawolo, says Nigeria is witnessing significant growth in non-oil contribution to the nation's GDP, occasioned by increased trade volumes, export of non-traditional goods and exports to new markets. He says that engagements with the private sector, relevant government institutions and foreign missions are strengthening synergies and yielding positive outcomes for the sector. Mr. Wolo joins me on View from the Top today to discuss, and I want to thank him very much. Thank you, Mr. Wolo, for joining us. Thank you for having me. And I thank you for tuning in. Let me tell you a little bit about my guest before we get down to our conversation. Born on September 27, 1963, Olusegun Awolo got a law degree from the Ogun State University and was called to the Nigerian Bar in 1989. He worked with the law firms of Abayo Mishogbeso and Co. and GOK Ajayi and Co. Mr. Awolo also served in various positions in Chief of Basanjo's administration, including a special assistant on traditional institutions, special assistant on legal due diligence, and a special assistant legal matters. He also worked in the Federal Capital Territory Administration from 2007 as Secretary for Social Development and later as Secretary of Transport. In 2013, he was appointed Executive Director CEO of the Nigerian Export Promotion Council. It's a big task, is it not? Uh, we're all looking up to you and your team to drive the resources needed, needed for uh, development. How is NEPC doing in this direction? When I resumed office here and I was meeting the staff for the first time, uh, the first thing I told them, I said, look, you guys, you need to prepare because you are the next line of defense for the Nigerian economy. Uh, little did I know how much poetic I was being uh, when I made that, that statement because, as you know, uh, the, the, a couple of uh, uh, months after that, oil prices crashed and then it became Nigeria's uh, big problem. Uh, the, the problem we, we were facing uh, is not just a revenue problem, but I believe specifically it's a foreign exchange problem. So that means that any recovery uh, that we're going to make uh, for this, uh, to get out of the recession, uh, it must be the sustained growth of our economy must now be on the back of an export-led revival. And that's, that's the only way to go about it. And then we look at value-added exports as a way to create wealth uh, for our country. Uh, the NEPC was created uh, the same year with NMPC, but, and that was just it. Uh, after that, it was just uh, all about NNPC, and nobody paid attention to NEPC again after uh, the sweet benefits of oil. Now, let me, let me put it in proper perspective for you so you can understand the agony the country is now, and particularly the, the, the federal government. In 2014, you earned $70 billion from oil proceeds. You had an import bill of $50 billion. But then, come down to 2016, your revenue is about 30 something billion dollars. Now, you have this import bill of over $50 billion that government is trying to reduce by, look, let's start uh, growing uh, what we eat. Let's start eating what we grow. You know, various mantras just to get public relied less 
on importation. But I say no. Yeah, that is fine. But the money, most important thing to do is to get a supply of foreign exchange from other sources. You must just develop a new basket of exports so you can hand the revenue. And this and office is up to the task. And that's what we're doing. You know, the goal we're told is to uh, shift the focus from export of raw produce mm -hmm. to value-added products, mm -hmm. to increase revenue, create jobs, and, uh, you know, improve lives. That's always been the problem, has it not been? Uh, we export hides and skin, and we yeah. import shoes. Mm -hmm. We export cocoa, and we import oh, chocolate. chocolate. Mm -hmm. We export cotton, and we import mm -hmm. textiles. But how can people add value to their products when industries are all closed? Government has been looking at it. For instance, the Nigerian Industrial Revolution Plan, uh, a key thing about it was, uh, look, we want to move away from just exporting raw materials uh, so we can generate, because the money really is in the value addition. Yes, you make some money uh, on just exporting raw materials, but the real value uh, is, is in the uh, value added. For instance, cocoa you mentioned, the cocoa, uh, uh, business is, it trades about 20 billion uh, annually globally all over the world that's the figure it's about 20 billion dollars but chocolate is going about 80 billion dollars so where I stock even though countries like Switzerland that don't have one single cocoa tree you know they earn the most money while we just get peanut the commodities based uh, economy uh, is, though at times, quite lucrative, but it's very volatile. You know, I'm wondering, how can Nigerian exports compete in the same market as, say, uh, the, the Chinese exports? Let me give you an, an analogy I always uh, give people. Made in Aba, made in Taiwan, made in China. Uh, some 40 years ago, the same level. What changed? What changed? Yeah. I tell you what changed. China realized that they must increase uh, their productivity. Uh, they must uh, add value uh, to it. They must increase the, the standards and so they can compete internationally. In the beginning, everything made in Taiwan or China was, we, we were calling it fake. Fake. Like it was not about make, make fake. We, also, we wanted German products, American products. And that's why we are, but they continue to grow. They continue to grow. They continue to improve on their products. Right now, so their products are competing internationally. And right now, we don't even remember uh, the old, for instance, an example, the old television. Uh, do you remember Grundig? You don't, because everybody now uses the Samsung television. So... That, that, that is all. You increase and improve on what you're doing and you continue to, uh, to, 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 to grow it. That's how you can. And it can be done. It can be done. And we're seeing it. Nigeria, made in Nigerian goods are competing, you know, all over the world, you know, particularly in West Africa.